So if now I want to know what the total flux is through this sphere, that's very easy. Because since this is a sphere, the E vector in magnitude is everywhere the same, because the radius is the same, the same distance to this charge, and dA and E are parallel. So it's simply the surface for pi r squared of that sphere times E. And so now I have that the total flux through that closed surface is simply 4 pi r squared times E. Well, what is E? The electric field at this distance r equals q divided by 4 pi epsilon zero r squared times r roof. That gives me the direction. And so, if I know that the flux is 4 pi r squared times e, I put the 4 pi r squared here, I lose the 4 pi r squared, and I find that the e vector, at least the magnitude of the electric field, uh, excuse me, that the flux phi, that's what I want to calculate, I multiply this by e, equals q divided by epsilon zero. And this is independent of the distance r. And that's not so surprising, because if you think of it as air flowing out, then all the air has to come out somehow, whether I make the sphere this big or whether I make the sphere this big. So the flux being independent of the size of my sphere, the flux is given by the charge, which is right here at the center, divided by epsilon zero. Now, if I had chosen some other shape, not a sphere, but I have dented it like this, it's clear that the air that flows out would be exactly the same. And so I don't have to take a sphere to find this result. I could have taken any type of strange closed surface around this point charge, and I would have found exactly the same result. And if I put more than one charge inside this potato bag, then clearly since I know that electric fields from different charges can be added, should be added vectorially, it is clear that the relation should also hold for any collection of charges inside the bag. And therefore, we now arrive at our first milestone in 802, which we call Gauss's law. And Gauss's law says that the flux, the electric flux, going through a closed surface, being the closed surface of E dot dA is the sum of all charges Q which are inside the bag that you may choose at any time you pick that bag divided by epsilon zero. And this is the first of four equations of Maxwell which are at the heart of this course. So the electric flux through any closed surface is always the charge inside that closed surface divided by epsilon zero. And if that flux happens to be zero, it means there is no net charge inside the bag. There could be positive, there could be negative charges, but the net is zero. Gauss's law always holds, no matter how weird the charge distribution inside the bag, no matter how weird the shape of this bag, it always holds. But Gauss's law won't help you very much if you don't have a situation whereby the charges are distributed in a very symmetric way. Gauss's law holds, but it doesn't do you any good if you want to calculate the electric field. In order to calculate successfully the electric field, you do need forms of symmetry, and there are three forms of symmetry that we will deal with in 802. One is, of course, spherical symmetry. Another one is cylindrical symmetry. And a third one is flat planes with uniformly charged distributions. 
then we also have situations of symmetry. And so now I would like to, as a first example, use an application of Gauss's law, and I will start with a situation of spherical symmetry. And I use a thin shell, a hollow sphere, which is thin. And so this radius is R. And I put charge Q on here, but it is uniformly distributed. That's crucial. If it's not uniformly distributed, I have no symmetry. I can't do the problem. So it's uniformly distributed. We will learn later in the course that it's very easy to do this because any conductor of this shape, if you bring charge on it, will automatically distribute itself uniformly. So we have the charge plus Q on there, uniformly distributed, that's a must. And I would like to know now, what is the electric field here at a distance R from the center, and what is the electric, electric field here at a distance R from the center? In other words, I want to know what is the electric field everywhere in space, just due to this charged, uniformly charged sphere. And with Gauss law, it just goes like that. You now have to choose your Gauss surface. And if you don't choose it in a clever way, you get nowhere. In a case like this, I would think it is rather obvious that the Gauss surface that you would choose are themselves spheres, concentric spheres. If you want to know what the electric field is at this point, you choose a sphere with this radius r going through that point. And if you want to know what it here is, you choose a sphere going through that point all the way enclosed. It's a concentric sphere. And now, you have to use symmetry arguments. And the symmetry arguments are the following. Since this is spherically symmetric, this problem, if you are here, whatever the electric field is here in magnitude must be the same as it is there, and it must be the same as it is there, because of the symmetry of the problem. It couldn't be any larger here than it could be here. That's obvious. That's a symmetry argument, because the charge here is uniformly distributed. That's symmetry argument number one. Now comes another symmetry argument, and that is the electric field, if there is an electric field, must be either radially pointing outwards or radially pointing inwards. So either it has to be like this or it has to be like this, and here the same, either like this or like this. Because we already know if this is a positive charge, that is going to be pointing outward. It cannot go like this or like this, because nature could not decide in this spherically symmetric problem to go like this or like this. It can only go radially. That's the second symmetry argument. So now, if we go to this sphere now, and we know that E is radially outwards, apart from a plus or a minus sign, apart from the fact that the angle between dA and E could either be 0 degrees or 180 degrees, we know now that the surface area of that sphere, which is 4 pi r squared, times the magnitude of the E vector right here, I can do that now because dA and E are either parallel or anti-parallel, that must be equal to Q inside divided by epsilon 0. There is no Q inside, so E must be 0. 